Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. This is the next episode in the Coding A Physics Engine in Java series. So in the last episode, what we did was we went over line intersections between boxes and lines. So testing whether a line is intersecting with a box. In this tutorial, what we're gonna be doing is pretty similar, except we're actually gonna be formalizing it a little bit more. So what we're gonna be doing is ray casting. So specifically ray casting against circles and ray casting against boxes. So hopefully this will give you some insight into why people will say don't do a ray cast because it takes a lot of time. We're going to talk a little bit about the specific operations that people cause people to say that. And then we're also going to look at how to return a ray cast result if you ray cast it against a circle or a box in 2D space. Okay, so let's get started with circles. Before we do start this, I'm going to immediately say that we're gonna save the box for the next tutorial. I was thinking that we'd be able to just copy and paste code, but when I was looking through some of the uh, work that I did, it looks like it's actually gonna be a little bit more involved uh, for rotated boxes specifically. So we're gonna save that for the next tutorial, but we will focus on raycasting against circles in this tutorial. How do you raycast against a circle? What is the process, okay? So right here, I have drawn a little raycast and we have some coordinates listed out and everything. The origin of our raycast is located at one, one. The direction of our raycast is located at eight tenths, six tenths. So that gives us a, a normal vector. It's a unit vector, right? If we add these up and square them, uh, we'll see that 64 plus 36 over 100 is just 100 over 100 which tells us that this is a vector of length one. So that's all good, which is everything we need for a ray, uh, for a well-defined ray. What do we want returned from this ray? Well, we want this point, right? We want to figure out where exactly it hit this circle. So the first step we're gonna take is very similar to what we did for our circle versus line detection. Uh, first, we're gonna draw a vector from the origin of the ray to the center of our circle. We're gonna call this vector E, okay? Using this vector, we can get this point, if we go perpendicular, this point right here, which we'll call this length A. So this length from the origin of the vector to this point right here where it's perpendicular to the center of the circle is, we're, we're just gonna call that length A, right? And typically when we're doing rate casts and stuff, we define things in terms of lengths along the vector. So how many units along the vector do we have to travel to get to a certain position? And that's just because it's the easiest way to think about all this stuff, okay? Now, you may look at this and you're like, okay, well, this is pretty similar to what we've done before. I think we can solve for this length A pretty easily, right? We just project this vector E onto this vector uh, that is our direction vector of our ray, right? And so if we project it, it just smushes it down so that we get that point exactly. Well, how do we project it? Let's just do, uh, so we're gonna call E our vector right there. And then we'll call this direction vector. We'll just say, let's what's E dot D, okay? The direction of our vector. Well, we know that E dot D is just the magnitude of E times the magnitude of D times cosine of theta. Well. We also know from Sokotoa that cosine of theta is just adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, in this case, what's adjacent and what's hypotenuse? Well, adjacent would be this line right here, right? And then hypotenuse would be the length of E. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. So let's plug that in. So we have the, la the magnitude of E times the magnitude of D times cosine of theta, which is really just adjacent, which is actually A, right? That's the length we're looking for over hypotenuse, which is just the length of E, which is the magnitude of E. Well, these cancel, that's nice. Well, that's just the magnitude of D times the magnitude of A. But remember what I said in the beginning, the magnitude of D is one, right? This is a unit vector, so that cancels out. One times anything is itself, and you'll see that we get A directly. So this is a very simple problem, Really cool feature of dot products. We literally just do a couple of additions and we get the length of A just by doing E dot D. So let's do that real quick. So E is the vector, if we look at it, it's five minus one is four and the Y is six minus one is five. So that's E and we know D is eight tenths. So E dot D would look something like four, five dot eight tenths and six tenths. Well, if we do four times eight, that's 32 over 10 is 3.2 plus 
5 times 6 is 30 over 10 is 3, which is just 6.2. Okay, so now we know that the length of A is 6.2. That's pretty cool, but it's still not quite what we want, right? Ideally, if we could get the length from here to here, we'll call that T. If we can get that T length, then we know exactly where that point is, right? Because it's just the origin plus the direction times T, and that will get us that point. Okay, well, let's find a couple more variables that will help us in this search. Okay, so I drew a blue line here, and this is just the radius of the circle, right? Because if we go from the center of the circle to this point here, that's just the radius. You may be thinking, how does this help us, right? What's the point of this? Well, we know the length of R, right? And we, if we could find this length right here from T to the center, right? We could call that length A. And if we can find that, then we know that T is just A minus F which would be really easy. So if we can find this, then we're good. Let's call this side B. Now, is there any way we could find the side B? And you guys should be screaming, yes, there is a triangle right here. Look, if we trace out this red triangle or that red line to here, to here, what we get is one big right triangle. And we already know what the magnitude of E is. We know what the magnitude of, we, we know what A is, right? We just found A, it's the length of this. We'll say that equals a. So we know that b squared is equal to e squared, the length of e squared minus a squared. Well, let's find the length of e squared, right? So the magnitude of e squared is equal to 4 squared, which is 16, plus 5 squared, which is 25, and that's just 41, okay? So if we expand this, that would just be 41 minus a squared, which is 6.2. And I have all this pre-calculated, and this is just 38.44. And if we subtract those, we get 2.56. And if we look at our picture, you can see that that's kind of true. If we look at B, that looks around two and a half units of length, right? Uh, based on this graph, which I tried to make this all as accurate as possible for us. Okay, so now that we have B, we know B, we know R, we should be able to figure out what F is, right? And this is where the costliness of a ray cast comes in, because the only way for us to find f is by taking a square root. This is the only way. There's no way around it at this point. We just have to do it. So we know that f is going to be r squared minus the square root of r squared minus b squared, which we know is just r is 4, because the length of uh, the radius is 4. We can just check that by counting the graph squares. That's 16 minus, and then b squared is this guy right here, which is just 2.56. And then we can say that's approximately 3.67. So we almost have everything we need, right? This is literally just about everything we need. Now we just say T equals A minus F. Well, we have A, right? A is just right here, which is 6.2. We have F, we just solved for that. That's 3.67, which this gives us a grand total of 2.53. So there we go, we've done it. We've just ray cast this ray against this circle and we got the result 2.53. That's not too bad. I hope you guys are seeing that this is actually some pretty simple stuff. If you just look at it and take a little bit of time to explore it, you can solve this stuff for yourself. Now, what about the cases when this ray cast will fail? How do we know if it's gonna fail? Well, the first, way we would know it's going to fail is if we get a negative result, right? So if we end up getting something negative, what that implies is that actually the result is somewhere behind the ray. And so if it's behind the ray, then we don't count that as a valid result. So what we say is if t is less than zero, then it's uh, invalid. We would return false. And we can't actually ever get to this point too because we would end up getting imaginary numbers, right? Because let's take a look at this. T is A minus F and we know F is R squared minus B squared, right? And so if we continue up this chain, we can say F equals the square root of R squared minus B squared, which is actually just the square root of, if we look at B squared, that's the magnitude of E squared minus A squared. So R squared minus the magnitude of E squared minus a squared and we could go even farther up this too and we could say a well that's just e dot d and continue with this but anyways if this result is negative um, what that tells us is the whole 
t would be negative 2, but this would actually give us an imaginary number since you can't take the square root of a negative. So if this is negative, then we would return false. And then one more thing that you would have to check is if the raycast's origin starts within the center or within the circle, because what would end up happening is a would actually look like this, right? We would get a right here, and then f would be the distance from here to this guy, and t would be this distance right here. And so what's going to happen is if you subtract a minus f, so if we did a minus f, what we would end up getting is um, the wrong result. So what we actually have to do is a plus f, which will give us the distance from here to here. Okay, but those are the edge cases covered. Let's just get into coding this and see how this all works out in the code. It should be very similar to what we have written down here. Before we can start coding Raycast, we actually need a Raycast, right? So let's go into here, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a new class, and we'll just call this a Raycast. Technically, array would just be better because it's really just array. Um, okay, we'll just call it array, Ray 2D. <laughs> So if we go into here, what does array consist of? Well, array consists of a couple things. It just consists of a private vector 2f, which is its origin, and a private vector 2f, which is its direction. And we're going to assume the direction is always normalized, and we're going to assume that because when anybody creates a array using the two input parameters, which are vector 2f origin and vector 2f direction, what we're going to say is this dot origin equals origin and this dot direction equals direction. Then we're going to say this dot direction dot normalize. So we know it's always going to be a unit vector because we normalize it in its construction. And then next, let's create a public vector to F origin or get origin. Return this dot origin and public vector to F direction say get direction, return this dot direction. Okay, so we have everything we need for array now. Uh, we do need one more class though, and that is a raycast result. And so this will be a thin wrapper around raycast results, just some stuff that we're going to need. So what is this going to consist of? Well, this is going to consist of a private vector 2f point. So this is the point at which the raycast hit whatever object it hit. Private vector 2f normal and so the normal direction is going to be like the direction it's bouncing off of the object of right so whatever direction so if it was like a circle it would be the direction perpendicular to exactly the point it hit on that circle and then private float t which was that t variable we were talking about and a private boolean hit which is whether or not the raycast was hit then we'll say raycast result initialize all these we'll just say this dot point equals new vector 2f, this dot normal equals a new vector 2f, this dot t, we'll say just equals negative 1 for now, and then we'll say this dot hit equals false, because we don't know if it's been hit or not yet. Then we're going to create a couple more functions. We're going to have a public void in it. This is going to take a vector 2f point and a vector 2f normal, float, t, and boolean hit. We'll literally just set all these to be whatever these were. Actually, we'll, we'll say this dot point dot set point. So we'll just copy the values into our vectors. And then we'll say uh, this dot t equals t and just copy those values as well. This dot hit equals hit. And so this is for whenever we're using this raycast result, we can just call in it so that we don't have to construct new raycast results. We can just sort of have a pool of them laying around. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. And then lastly, I'm going to make a static method, static void reset raycast result result and we're going to say if result does not equal null result.point.0 result.normal.set uh, 0 0 and we're going to say result.t equals negative 1 and result.hit equals false this will be useful because like i said before we're going to be using a pool of results and we're doing this check for null because You'll see in a minute how we're going to set this up and everything. It will be useful if it's not if it's null just to not do anything. Okay. Let's go into intersection detector 2D. And we have this ray versus primitive tests. We can just call this raycast, right? Because that's what we're doing. And time to code all that stuff we were just talking about. Okay, so let's call this public static. And it's going to return a Boolean raycast. We're going to take in a circle. 
which is the circle we're ray casting against, and a ray, which is the ray we're using to ray cast. This is a ray 2D. And a ray cast result, which is optional, and this can just be passed in as null if you're not actually casting, uh, you don't actually want the result. You just want to know whether it hit or not. So this function is going to sort of serve two purposes. It's going to be able to tell you the exact information you want. But if you don't care about that information, then it will just return a Boolean true if it hit it, false if it did not. So that's the reason we have that whole null check and everything. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say raycast result dot reset result. So if that result is not null, this will make sure that it says it was not hit so, because we don't know if we hit or not yet. Then we're going to say vector 2f origin to circle center. So this is, uh, we'll just say origin to circle. This is the uh, vector e that we were talking about, right? So this is just from the origin to the circle center. And this is a new vector 2f. We're going to say it's circle dot get center dot sub array dot get origin. And that should work just fine. And we'll say float radius squared. Uh, we're just going to store these for use later. And we're going to say this is circle dot get radius times circle dot get radius. Nice and simple. And then flow origin to circle length squared. We're going to store this for use later too because we do need this. Uh, we're just going to say this is origin to circle length squared. Okay, now first thing we do, we project the vector from the ray origin onto the direction of the ray. Remember, so this is the first step we were doing. This is our a value, right? This is a's length. And this is just origin to sphere or origin to circle. <laughs> I'm referencing old code here. Dot dot ray dot get normal or get direction. So remember, we just dot product between uh, this was like e dot d. And this is all we're doing right there. Float b squared, which is that uh, the length from the center of the circle down to the projected point is just origin to circle length squared minus a times a. And then what we can say is if radius squared minus b squared is less than 0, 0.0f, then this is that value. Uh, it was negative one. It indicates that it was not hit. So we'll return false because we can't take the square root of a negative number. Otherwise, we can take the square root. We'll say float f equals float math dot square root radius squared minus b squared. And let me just talk very quickly. This is what makes the raycast expensive. So in a Intel i7 processor, I looked this up, the length of a square root takes around 25 CPU cycles, whereas the length of a multiplication, which is what we could do if we could just do the length squared, that takes around five CPU cycles. So this is five times slower is what you can think of it than not taking the square root. This is why people say raycasts are slow. So now you know. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to find t. So we're going to say float t equals zero, initialize it to zero. And we'll say if the length of origin to the sphere, origin to circle, length squared, is less than radius squared, then the ray starts inside the sphere, I mean circle. <laughs> and so then we're going to say t equals a plus f. We're just reversing the direction uh, so that we end up getting it correct, right? And then otherwise, it's a normal intersection, which means t is just a minus f, which that should be wrapped in an else statement. <laughs> then we're going to say if result does not equal null. So if they want the result, then we'll say vector 2f point equals new vector 2f ray dot get direction or get origin dot add ray dot get direction dot multiply by t. Okay, so we just do origin plus direction times t, which gets us the point that it was hit. And then we're going to say vector 2f normal equals new vector 2f point. So the point that we just found dot sub. So we're going to subtract the circles center. So circle dot get center, which will give us the direction from the center to the point we hit. And then we'll normalize that so that it is the correct normal. And then we'll say result dot init point normal t and we hit it so it is true and we will also return true down here regardless of whether we're returning a result or not so that's it 
This should successfully raycast against the circle using this Ray 2D, and it will store the information inside the result. If you want to test this, you should check out my last video where I talked about uh, tests, and you can add in a new test inside of our collision detector tests. That will check and see if this result is actually true or not. So it will, you can hand do some results. Actually, you can use the example we did and just make sure that this returns the correct result, that it does what it should do. Okay, guys, in the next tutorial, what we're gonna be doing is ray casting against boxes. So those are even more complicated, unfortunately, but we should be able to get pretty good because if you saw the line versus box, uh, it's gonna be very similar to what we did here, just a little bit different. So if you understood that, then the next tutorial shouldn't be too bad. But yeah, I hope you guys liked this. If you did, please hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks.